welcome. Take a minute to think about your first day in AP Human Geography, or maybe your first week or your first month. Were you scared, excited, maybe intimidated or confused? Maybe you've taken many AP classes, so this felt like just another day. At that time, maybe your teacher was talking about site and situation or the tools that geographers use, and maybe you were feeling a little confused or wondering, are you ever gonna get through this class? Are you going to make it to the AP test? Well, look, here you are, ready to tackle the big test here at the end of the year. And maybe you're feeling some of those same emotions. Maybe you're scared, maybe you're excited, maybe you're a little bit intimidated. Well, I'm glad you are here because we are going to dive into what is going to make you successful on that AP test. I'm Ms. Neuroth. I'm coming to you here from Nashville, Tennessee, and let's get started. What are we going to learn tonight? Just like in our other sessions, the goal is to see how all of the pieces of AP Human Geography fit together. You may feel like you have a whole set of facts and ideas and theories and models rolling around in your brain right now. And you may remember a lot of it, but you might be a little nervous or intimidated about putting that all together on the AP test. Well, that's what we're here for. We are going to focus tonight on one of the skills that will be necessary for you to have in order to do well on the AP exam. And we're gonna practice that skill together with practice multiple choice and practice FRQ questions. So let's dive in. This time we are focusing on data analysis. And I had to throw the little brain in there today because this one works your brain. We are gonna look at identifying the different types of data presented in maps and quantitative and geospatial data. This is all about taking a look at the stimuli or the map graph chart or any other visual that may come with a test question. And trust me, you'll definitely see those pop up on the AP test. So the first one starts with the simple act of being able to identify whatever it is in that stimuli that they provide for you. The second takes it up a notch. Can you describe spatial patterns presented in maps and quantitative and geospatial data? So we'll work on what does it mean to describe something, especially in reference to some kind of stimulus that you see. Next, we're going to explain patterns and trends in maps and quantitative and geospatial data to draw conclusions. We'll move on from there to compare patterns and trends in maps and in quantitative and geospatial data to draw conclusions. This is the kind of thing that you'll see pop up a lot on an FRQ test, really being able to demonstrate not only that you understand the pattern or trend, but then can you draw a conclusion from that information? We'll go on to explaining what maps or data may imply or illustrate about geographic principles, processes, or outcomes. Finally, we'll end with explaining the possible limitations of the data provided. This is the fun part. This is where we basically get to say, what's wrong with the data? We get to pick it apart and say what it's not helpful for or why it may not be as useful as it could be. We've got six items there to tackle tonight. So you can see why we're gonna to need to have our brains on ready to go. This may seem a little odd. You may even think to yourself, I thought I was here to get a review on the demographic transition model or maybe on some key vocabulary. Well, here's the great thing. That's going to be embedded in our session together. These skills will all pop up somewhere on the AP test. Not only is every question going to ask you about something like voluntary migration, it's also going to have some sort of skill that you're going to need to employ in order to answer that question correctly. So that's why we're tying the two together as we review with you. Let's jump in. Here's our first example of a skill you'll need to be able to have. We're gonna start with the simple one. 
identifying different types of data. The question here is, what do the data in the map show? Whenever you see a map or a graph or a chart on the test, you wanna first take a moment to read whatever title or other information corresponds with that map. So as I look at the one here, I see that it is GDP per capita. And if I remember from class, I might remember my teacher saying that per capita means per person. So I'm seeing this uh, is from the World Bank and there's, um, I, I see the scale down there at the bottom telling me what each of the colors means, um, starting there down in the low thousands all of the way up to more than 70,000. And I may just take a moment to observe what I see here in the map. Notice it says on the, on the side there, can you identify categories of data presented in maps? And what patterns do you observe? So as I step back here for a moment, I observe the map, I notice that those darkest colors, the wealthiest parts of the world tend to be in North America, in Western Europe. I see uh, around um, the Arabian Peninsula and even in Australia and New Zealand. That makes sense to me because I've learned that those are also the regions of the world where we typically see the highest levels of development. I also tend to notice that uh, I, I notice that some landlocked countries tend to have lower levels of development. I see that in parts of um, Africa south of the Sahara. I also see that in um, parts of uh, West Asia. And, and I may start to even draw some conclusions from that. Let's take a moment to practice what this skill would look like on the test. So let's dive in with a piece of an FRQ question. Here's one that was on the AP test a few years ago. So the little thought bubble there says, can you identify the data presented in this map? This would likely be one of the first questions you would see at the beginning of an FRQ. They're wanting to see, can you first understand whatever stimulus they've provided for you? And then can you go on to do some of the more complicated skills? So in this case, we would see at the top of the map, percent of women in the labor force working in agriculture. And the question corresponding with that map might be something like this. Identify a country where more than 75% of women in the labor force are active in agriculture. Well, the first thing I need to do is go over here to my scale or my, my key or my legend there to see what color I'm gonna need to be on the lookout for. So anything in that darkest color there from 76 to 98% is gonna be a country where more than 75% of women in the labor force are active in agriculture. So I've noted what color I need to be on the lookout for. Now I need to be able to name one of those countries. So little side note here, if you aren't super clear on your countries, if you haven't brushed up on that, maybe you've worked on that with your teacher a lot, maybe you haven't, I highly recommend brushing up on that before the test. You wouldn't wanna finish an AP geography class and not know where your countries are, right? You could see a question like this on the test. Now, while they won't be asking a ton of questions about where different countries are, it is important that you have a good idea of where the majority of countries are so that you'll be prepared for a question like this. Let's keep going. Let's look at another skill that you'll need to have on the AP test. Describe spatial patterns in quantitative data. This is data that can be measured. So the question you see here is, what patterns can you identify from the data? Can you describe the patterns, such as land use patterns and practices in different agricultural regions? So I put together here a table of hypothetical countries, country W, X, Y, and Z. I've got the total land area listed there, the agricultural land use percentage in 1950, and then the agricultural land use percentage in 2020. So you'll notice that for some of these countries, like country W, for instance, we see that the land use percentage actually drops. 
Whereas in country X, we see that the land use percentage rises slightly. Country Y, land use rises over time. And in country Z, it rises ever so slightly. So the overall trend that I notice is that for most countries, the agricultural land use percentage is rising. I do also note that country W seems to have the most land devoted to agriculture, whereas that final country, country Z, has a much, much smaller amount of land devoted to agriculture. So I'm just sort of talking myself through the data right now. You don't want to talk out loud in the AP exam, but have a running dialogue going with yourself in your head so that you're making sure that you carefully look at whatever data is presented in a chart or a graph or a table like this. And as you're doing that, take some time to notice, are there any patterns that start to stand out to you from the data that's presented? Here's another one we can look at. What patterns can you identify from this data? So can you describe the patterns in the data, such as land use patterns and practices in different agricultural regions? Now, this one is slightly different. You'll notice that the title here is Rice Production, 1961 to 2018. So I noticed that there are three countries listed, China, India, and the United States. Now, it's interesting because the United States doesn't seem to change very much over time over that roughly 60 year period. But I noticed that India and China started out at almost the exact same point. And while both of them do increase quite dramatically over that period of time, China does grow significantly more rice than India does. And there may be a host of different reasons for that, but that overall trend and increase in rice production is quite interesting. Those countries also did add quite a few people to their population, and they benefited from Green Revolution technology, which likely helped them increase their rice production. I'm thinking through all of these things as I'm observing the data. You might have noticed that I'm pulling in information that I've learned throughout the year from different units, helping me to provide some context and background for the information that you see there. So you might like to do the same thing as you're observing any kind of data you might see on the AP test. Let's look at yet another example of a skill you'll need to have. This time, we're looking at explaining patterns and trends. So how does the trend in the data inform your conclusion? How does the trend in the data support your conclusion? So as I'm looking through the data, just as I was doing a moment ago with China and India and their rice production, I was allowing the data to inform me. And then I was drawing some possible conclusions about that data. So I have here in this green box, can you identify multiple patterns or trends within a data set? And can you describe how and why they are related like population pyramids and economic developments? Well. Let's take a look. Let's practice with that concept. So here I have the beginning of an FRQ. This is the stimulus that was used for this particular question. So you'll see the little light bulb here getting you starting to think as you're observing these two pyramids. Can you explain patterns and trends in the pyramids? Before I even reveal the question, maybe you're thinking to yourself as you're looking at country A, Wow, that country has a wide base. So that tells me that they probably have, or they certainly have, a high birth rate. You may also notice that the top of that pyramid is very skinny, indicating that they have a high death rate as well, or a low life expectancy. You may even remember that uh, population pyramids coincide very well with the DTM, or the demographic transition model. And you may think to yourself, this looks like a stage two country. Whereas if we take a look at country B, this clearly looks like a very different situation. We have a lot more older people telling us that perhaps healthcare is much better in this country. They certainly have a much longer life expectancy. And if we look at the base of the pyramid, it seems to be getting smaller and smaller each year, which indicates that this country 
is potentially moving into stage five if they're not already there with that extremely low birth rate that is likely even lower than the death rate. So let's jump to the question and see what you might be asked about something like this. So here we go, it says, the population pyramids represent two countries at different stages of the demographic transition and economic development. Explain the demographic characteristics of each country with respect to the demographic transition model. So I essentially just did that. And, and if I had covered up the question and I was a student just observing those pyramids, I might have naturally gone down that path if I was thinking to myself of everything that I had learned about population pyramids. So the key there is that they want us to explain. If you remember from the previous video, whenever you see that word explain, you want to make sure that you are answering the how or the why. So we would explain what we saw with regards to birth rates and death rates. We may even explain why a country may look like that. So for instance, country A would be in stage two of the demographic transition. Why? Because you notice that wide base at the bottom indicating that high birth rate, the skinny top indicating a high death rate and a low life expectancy. You may have noticed that I emphasized the word because as I stated before, whenever you see that word explain, you wanna make sure that you have because in your answer somewhere. That will help you make sure that you are getting to the heart of why something is happening or how something is happening. Let's keep going. One tip, again, um, I, I got ahead of myself here a little bit, a helpful tip for writing an FRQ response, as I just said, is that when you are asked to explain, you should focus on answering the how or the why. One way to see if you've done this is to check your answer and see if you have the word because in it. Make a little mental note of that now. If you take anything away from tonight, this would be one of the things I want you to make sure you take away. Let's keep going. Here's another example of a skill you'll need to have. Compare patterns and trends. What conclusions can you draw by comparing the trends you found in the data? How does the pattern or trend in one data set compare with that in another data set? So in essence, can you compare trends and draw conclusions about the data and then be able to explain your reasoning? So you can see here that Taking the AP test is not just about remembering facts or remembering vocabulary. That is a really common misconception that students have when going to take an AP test, especially an AP human geography test. They think if they know all of the vocabulary, if they've done all of the flashcards, that they're going to then know what they need to know for the test. Well, yes, that is important. It's all about what you do with that knowledge. And for instance, Comparing patterns and trends is an important piece of that. So let's practice what that actually looks like. So here I have, again, some more data for you from agricultural production regions. Again, I'm always gonna get into the habit of reading the title. So percent of land used for agriculture for selected regions. I noticed that we have the percent on the, the left side or the Y axis and the years on the X axis. And I see that there are five regions represented, East Asia and the Pacific, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, and the Middle East and North Africa. And I see that they each have different dotted lines or dashed lines or different um, darkness of the line to indicate the different regions. I wanna take a moment to really take that in because if I don't read the graph carefully, I may potentially answer the question incorrectly. So the question you see here or the thought bubble is, can you compare the patterns and trends to draw conclusions? So let's see what kind of question they may throw at us with this type of data. So it says, using the graph, compare the trend lines for the region of Europe and the region of the Middle East and North Africa for the 1981 to 2001 time period. 
Now that seems really random, doesn't it? Seems like a strange question. But if you notice, they are really testing to see, can you read that graph accurately? Can you look at the correct regions and the correct time period and be able to draw a conclusion from that? So let's start with Europe. We notice that Europe is like that dotted line that you see up there farther towards the top. Now, if I only look at Europe first, I notice that the overall trend tends to be down. Now, I'm not gonna get mistaken though because it has asked me for a very specific period of time. Now, the great thing is on the AP test, you can write all over that paper um, if you're taking it on paper. You can draw a line from 1981 to 2001. You can you know, highlight or star that line so that you can make sure you're focusing in on the right portion of the graph. Now, even if I look at 1981 to 2001 and I hone in specifically on that area, I can still see that the trend is down. It's decreasing in that region. Now let's go to the Middle East. I've got to go to the key at the bottom. And I know that the Middle East is that kind of funky um, dotted line there. Um, it's not the dot and the dash, but it's sort of that dashed line, I guess. You may have to look very carefully. You may need to take a moment to check yourself so that you're not accidentally comparing an incorrect portion of the data. Now that's interesting because it's farther down on the graph, but for that period of time from 1981 to 2001, there is a distinct increase in the percent of land used for agriculture. Quite a bit different than what I noticed for Europe. So again, if you notice that keyword is compare, I'm noticing a distinct difference. So my answer would need to include what I noticed for Europe and what I'm noticing for the Middle East. Now, here's something also to keep in mind. I highly recommend that if you're ever asked to use a stimulus, use data, be sure to use that data in your answer. So for instance, in this case here, if I were to be talking about the Middle East, I would say in 1981, the level of, or the percentage of land used for agriculture in the Middle East was roughly 25%. But by 2001, that level had increased to roughly 35%. And then I would go on to use similar numbers or similar data from the graph for Europe that's gonna indicate you really knew how to read the graph and how to incorporate that information thoughtfully into your answer. So again, that's what you wanna focus on for compare. Make sure that you address both regions. If you only talk about one, that's an incomplete answer and you wouldn't get the points on that on the AP test. Let's keep going. Here's our next example. We are to explain. Can you explain what maps or data imply or illustrate? So the key question here is, how do the data relate to a geographic process? So for instance, how can you apply information gleaned from a data source to a geographic principle, process, behavior, or outcome? Now, this is where that little brain was going at the beginning, because this is where we really start to get into more of the challenging concepts. So let's dive into what this will look like on the test. Yet another chart here, right? Now, you might have thought it was the same things. We're not talking about grain yields. We are now talking about wheat yields. Uh, I guess AP loves to talk about yields and put them on, on a little graph here. So just like I did last time, I'm going to take a moment here to make sure that I understand the graph. This is a common issue that I see with my students, and students make this mistake on the AP test all the time, where they get into wanting to answer the question so quickly that they actually don't take a moment, especially on an FRQ, to take a step back and make sure that they've actually looked at the stimulus carefully. So try to force yourself, if you know you're one of those students who rushes through, to pause for a moment and make sure you really understand what it is that you're looking at. So here we have yet, yet again, the wheat yields. 
We've got the pounds per acre on the side there in thousands, and we've got the years listed at the bottom. We have five regions, well, actually four regions, and then the total for the whole world. We've got East Asia, Europe, the world average, South Asia, and Africa. So the question in the thought bubble here now is, can you explain what this data illustrates? So let's see what kind of question they're gonna ask us about this table here. It says, the graph shows regional and global trends in wheat farming since 1961. In this graph, the amount of wheat is measured in pounds per acre of farmland. Now, I have a, a quick little side note here before we go any farther with this. And that is one of my most helpful hints to you. Make sure that you take time to annotate the FRQ question. And by that, I mean, make note of important command verbs, vocabulary, and any other important words or phrases. For instance, what scale do they want you to answer at? Is it the regional scale, the country scale, the state scale, the local scale? This will help you focus your thinking and can pre prevent you from answering incorrectly. So similar to what I said earlier, if all you remember tonight is to make sure that when you're answering and explain, you have a why or a how, in a similar way, if you remember this, you're gonna be on a good track. Maybe your teacher asked you to do this throughout the year, maybe they didn't, and either way, that's fine. But on the AP test, I highly recommend that you take an extra moment to do that. Let me illustrate what I mean by that as we return to our question. So here again, we have our graph and we have our FRQ question. There would be more to the question than what you see here, but I've selected this to illustrate how you're gonna practice this skill and also the different skills that we've been looking at tonight the skill of annotating, but also the skills related to data analysis. So it says, the graph shows regional and global trends in wheat farming since 1961. In this graph, the amount of wheat is measured in pounds per acre of farmland. So as I'm annotating that first piece, I may underline the words regional and global trends. I'm focusing in on the scale that this question is focusing on. You'll notice that there's, there's no specific question asked right there at the beginning, but I highly, highly encourage you to pay close attention to that. Read it carefully. Don't just skip over it and jump right into the question. Why you might ask? Well, when they're creating these questions, they do not put in any extra words if they don't have to. So if there's a little phrase or a couple of sentences before the FRQ begins, that is there to try to provide you with some help, to provide you with some guidance, maybe define something. So make sure to pay close attention to that. It's designed to frame your thinking and get you into the right mindset before jumping into answering the questions. Let's go on to A now. Using the graph, compare the wheat production trend lines of East Asia and Europe from 1961 to 1976. I just did a practice test with my students related to all of this. And one of the things that some of them made a mistake on, and maybe you've even made a similar mistake like this this year, they didn't pay attention to the time range. And it actually caused them to answer the question incorrectly or some of them actually compared the wrong regions. If they had annotated more carefully, perhaps they would have avoided that mistake. I doubt they'll do that on the AP test because now they know that it's easy to make those mistakes if you don't annotate carefully enough. Let's go on to part B. Explain how one improvement in agricultural technology so that's telling me, all right, I got to make sure my answer has some kind of ag agricultural technology in it. Had an impact on global wheat productivity with the emphasis there on global. So my answer needs to answer, needs to address that global scale, not the country scale, not the regional scale, but the global scale. 
Once again, this is one of those sneaky things, the concept of scale that throws students off. If they don't read that carefully, they may answer at the wrong scale. And while they may have a beautiful answer, if it's not what they're asking for, they won't get the points. All right, next one, part C. Explain why the Green Revolution had similar impacts on farming in South Asian countries compared to East Asian countries. Again, they're focusing us in on specific regions that they want us to talk about and the impacts. Finally, using one region on the graph, explain the relationship between changes in wheat farming practices and the education of women. Now, while you may be hoping that I'm going to go through the whole rubric for this and tell you all the right answers, I don't have time for that, but I will tell you that a big part of this is making sure if you've noticed here, the word explain pops up again and again and again, making sure that you've got that because that you look at something like, oh, let's tackle a hard one. Let's tackle part D. You get to choose the region. So let's say that we choose, I don't know, East Asia, the line that, that hits the top at the end of the graph there in 2016. So we've noticed that wheat farming practices uh, or that wheat um, yields have increased dramatically. We can assume that since 1961, Green Revolution technology in East Asia has helped them produce much more wheat than they were able to just 60 years ago. We may also come to the conclusion that if they're adopting Green Revolution technology, if they're increasing their wheat yields, perhaps they don't need as many people working in ag agriculture. That may free women up to do other things. We may also say that women being educated in better agricultural technology along with men would allow for better results um, better inputs, or sorry, better um, results from the work that they've done in their wheat fields. So there are a lot of different ways we could take that. But again, um, you noticed that I made sure to focus in on a specific region. And I also noted the time from 1961 all of the way to 2016, referring back to that and referring to the trend that I noticed there. So I was using those skills of identifying the data, of noticing trends and being able to explain that, and then being able to incorporate other information that I've learned throughout the year to provide a thoughtful answer. We are almost to the end of our set of skills on data analysis for tonight. So here's our final skill. Explain possible limitations of the data provided. I love this one because this allows us to be critical of the data. We are not limited to telling the uh, AP grader what we can see from the data. We get to tell them how the data is limited. This takes some really good thoughtfulness, some real good understanding of the data, but it's also kind of fun because we get to say how it's not useful. So the question here is, what is a limitation of using gross national income per capita as a measure of a country's level of development? Now, many geographers will look at GNI or even GDP to measure a country's level of development. So in this case, we see numbers. It can tell us a lot of information about how productive an economy is. It can tell us about uh, how wealthy the average citizen may be, but it's limited. It cannot tell us about the health of the citizens. It can't tell us how educated the citizens are. It certainly can't tell us if there is a large gap between rich and poor within the country. It can only tell us an average. So if I want to know how equal a society is, or if I want to know how uh, men are earning in society and how they're able to participate in the economy versus women, I'm not able to tell that with GDP or GNI or any of those monetary measures of development. Of development. 
So me being able to say that is not only a, a good understanding of the concepts of GNI or GDP, but also how there are other ways to measure development. And I can pick out that limitation because I know those other measures of development. So that's where this one gets pretty sophisticated. Here's another example here. What do the data tell you? And then what is a limitation, for instance, of using this map to understand voting patterns in the United States? So let's start with that key question. What does the data tell me? Well, I see here that this is how the United States voted in 2016. These were the winning electoral votes. And I see it broken down by state. So I see you know, which states are shaded in red to indicate that those states were leaning Republican and the states in blue leaning Democratic. And I see the uh, electoral vote tallies for each of those states. Now this is helpful data, right? It tells me about the final winning elect electoral votes for all of those states. But if I'm really trying to understand voting patterns in the United States, this is an incomplete picture. For instance, how does it break down by state? Was it really close? Do we notice a difference in the voting patterns of rural residents versus urban residents within each state? At this particular scale, I'm not able to see that breakdown. So that would be a possible limitation of using this particular set of data. What should you take away from what we've discussed tonight? Well, tonight we've discussed data analysis. We've identified the different types of data presented in maps and in quantitative and geospatial data. We started with that easy skill of literally just being able to identify the country on the map, identify the scale and being able to read the map. We took it up a notch by then describing spatial patterns presented in maps and quantitative and geospatial data. This is sometimes just that dialogue that goes on in your head when you're observing the data. You're making observations, you're describing what you're seeing, maybe even describing different trends that you're noticing, like the trends we described in wheat production. Then we go on, we went on to explain patterns and trends in the maps and in quantitative and geospatial data. We were noticing not only why the pattern is there uh, or that the pattern is there, but then we answered why the pattern looked like that. We drew some conclusions. We talked about things like green revolution technology, fertilizers, pesticides, improved varieties of seeds, how those technologies could impact wheat production, for instance. Then we went on to compare patterns and trends. And that's where I showed you that tricky FRQ question where you had to compare different regions of the world for a very specific time. That's a really sneaky thing that you may see on the AP test, but you're not gonna be fooled by that because you remember from tonight or from today that you are going to annotate the question so that you make sure that you're not missing any piece of the information as you go to answer the question. We then went on to explain what maps or data imply or illustrate about geographic principles, processes, and outcomes. Again, this is where things got even more um, high level. You are able to see an image, a graph, or a chart, and then be able to tie in other things that you've learned to help explain that. So I did that when we talked about what was going on with that trend line in East Asia and how I brought in that the education of women could have had an impact on that increase in yields in that particular region. Finally, we went to my favorite and we explained possible limitations of the data provided. We're able to acknowledge how the data is helpful, but then also, how it can be limited. It can't always show us everything that we need. In fact, in some ways, data can be deceptive by hiding certain patterns or trends, depending on what scale it's presented at, for instance. Well, by this point in time, you're probably ready for a break, but please join us. We're about halfway through now. 
We've got four more videos for you to help you feel as prepared as possible for the AP test. So as we wrap up here together, are you starting to see how all of these pieces of AP Human Geography are starting to fit together? Not just the information about uh, migration or vocabulary terms associated with political geography, for instance, but how the skills that you need all come together here at the end to help you show what you've learned throughout the year. So hopefully by this point, if you were feeling a little nervous or, or scared a little bit at the beginning, you're starting to feel a little bit more confident. Thank you again for joining us and we can't wait to see you in our next session.